your job is just to make yourself as good as possible. That's your job. You know, you write and you write and you write. And you and don't you write. just write one script. No, mm. no. You write a script, you get feedback from people that you trust, and then you write another one, and then you write another one. And you keep going, and eventually, when you are ready, and only the universe knows when that is, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you if you have religion, you'll you, it's when God decides, and if it's just, it's about fate, you know? It's like, there, when it's time, it's it's time. And, and a door opens. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the About Story Podcast. My name is Nathan Johnson, and today I am super privileged and honored to have Don Prestwich and Nicole Yorkin on my show today. Welcome, ladies. Well, thank you. We thank feel you very privileged, us. very honored ourselves, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> well, it is a privilege to have you. I've actually learned so much from you, and you know, being, having a chance to work with you has been just really a blessing, and just kind of seeing like the writing room and seeing how stories are actually made, so... I'm super excited about this interview. So, <laughs> well, let's jump right on in. Um, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about how you came to LA, LA and like how you started your kind of writing journey. Yeah. Well, I actually was born in Los Angeles. Mm, so I was there. a journalist for the LA Herald Examiner, which was Los Angeles's second paper after the LA Times. And I'd been there for about six years and I started getting a little bit itchy and wanted to do something else. And so I applied to the American Film Institute and got accepted as a writing fellow. Mm. And that's where I met Dawn. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in uh, Dallas, Texas. Nice. And I had no connection to this business. Um, I had no business in this business, <laughs> but I ended up um, going to school in the Bay Area and um, that got me out of Texas, and then I moved down to Los Angeles because at that point I had, I had taken enough film classes that I felt like, you know, I think that this is what I want to do. I think I want to get into this business somehow. And after a few years of being a, an assistant to a, a talent manager and um, buying her lots of groceries, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, applied to the American Film Institute as well. and in screenwriting and um and that's where nicole and i encountered each other so that's awesome the so. rest is history <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. so were you guys always kind of interested in writing and storytelling or did that sort of develop as you got older i was always a storyteller i i you know i maybe it's a southern tradition maybe it's just me or my family but i i love to tell stories i love to write stories it mm. never occurred to me that that was something you could do as a career, of course. I was just like, you know, that was just who I was. And when I learned, uh, when I started taking filmmaking classes, I realized, oh my God, you know, I like the visual stories all of a sudden became very real to me. And of course, you know, we grew up at a, at a time where we, we weren't so savvy about, um, you know, not everybody walked around with a camera in their hands mm. all the time and right. everybody wasn't editing stuff together and putting it on the internet of course and so so it took a while for it to sort of dawn on me um but but when i did it became you know a white hot passion hmm. yeah. and how about for you nicole well i have a different background than mm -hmm. dawn mm -hmm. um my father was a tv and film director and producer so i grew up in the business mm. <clears throat> excuse me more or less um, and for that reason, I tried to avoid it for a long time. That's why I oh, really? became a journalist, because mm. I thought I don't want to follow in the family footsteps. Was there a reason why? Just No, I, I like had a pressure, pr family pressure, maybe? Or? No, th there was no pressure. But I, I, as Don will know, I had a very realistic view of the business. I'd seen mm. my father, who was he and Norman Lear were partners for 25 years. I saw the ups and downs. I saw how you could, you know, work your ass off. Excuse my language. <laughs> you could you could work your butt off for um, a project, spend years on it, and you know it could get killed by a reviewer, mm -hmm. which would make a difference. Mm -hmm. I saw how um, you could pitch your heart out and not sell a story. So, 
You also saw like when um, when your dad was doing uh, All in the Family, you saw what happened when something was successful, but then there was a lot of people that hated you and it, right? Was, didn't he get a lot of flack? Oh, well, yes. I mean, in the beginning days of All in the Family, there was a lot of anti-Semitic um, mm -hmm. backlash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we did get a lot of hate notes. My dad did hate letters and things. Mm -hmm. Um, in the early days before that um, series became a success. So I, you know, I saw that part, side of it too. So I decided to go into journalism, but eventually um, went to AFI, met Don, we started working together, and I found that drama was more my path. My dad was always more comedy, mm -hmm. and um, whereas I'd like to think I can be funny when necessary. <laughs> but, She's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> But I did not choose that as my career path mm -hmm. in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the entertainment business. So, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what changed your mind? Like, what was, was there a moment in time where you're just like an awakening or like? Well, this will sound hysterically funny, but <laughs> when I was a journalist, I felt like I had no control over my life because I could be mm -hmm. sent anywhere at any time to cover mm -hmm. a story. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I thought I would have more control of my life in the film and, and TV business because obviously there's even no less control. control. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'd convinced myself of that. That's why I decided to apply to film school. And mm. um, I'd never written a script before um, I got there. I got in on the basis of the stories I'd told, um, you know, as a journalist. And um, so that was a whole new journey for me and I just sort of more naturally gravitated towards more dramatic mm. storytelling. Yeah, yeah. She was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, by the Thank way. You. Just have to Thank you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> <My partner. laughs> but you know, it's been really interesting um, for me as just a storyteller who will embellish and exaggerate. I mean, that was like, you know, that was the way it was. That's, you get a good laugh, right? Um, and being, being partnered with Nicole, Nicole's very, very grounded um, in terms of of making sure that there is truth to what we, mm. that the story we tell. And um, and that's probably the source of one of our biggest arguments, you know, when we're working, because because if she can't believe it, if she hasn't, if she hasn't <laughs> experienced or if she doesn't know about it in a way that, you know, really rings true to her, then then she's just like, no. <laughs> we're not we're not that we're not gonna say that line we're not gonna do that thing in the script we're not gonna do it and it's very frustrating but the truth is it i think that it has become a hallmark of the material is that we are we are very grounded realistic sure. writers mm -hmm. very naturalistic mm -hmm. writers our dialogue is naturalistic everything has to be able to because there are two of us too that our dialogue has to live in the room with us mm -hmm. because of the way we write we write everything together out loud which is which is just the way we do it we're, we're both kind of control freaks i think so but i also think you know when we started and we thought okay let's try to write something together yeah we didn't know how to do that mm. and so we just naturally thought oh you do it out loud together yeah you know we have since found many partnerships where people either switch off acts or they switch off scenes you know and they're writing separately and then they put it together and read it and edit it and we just didn't even know that you don't necessarily do that <laughs> so, I, know. Yeah. I know so we're so we're very you know i mean we will argue over um just the like just one word of description because mm. we'll want it to be the right word you know yeah. the perfect right word we won't just put yeah. any old word down you know we'll we want it to be the perfect word and it can really hold us up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but you know it, it's it's also wonderful because if the dialogue Nicole has to Nicole now we've sort of evolved to this point where Nicole will be the she likes to see it on the screen and I like to hear it mm. and so she was she will be the one that's typing it into the into you know typing the document and and then she has to read it back to me because she really doesn't want me reading over her shoulder. <laughs> That yeah. makes her crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. then I'm like, no, go back. No, I think we could do something different here. And she's yeah. like, no, <laughs> just stop it. It's fine. <laughs> but, 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 but she, you know, but, but she has to read it back to me. And, and so the dialogue that she's reading back has to be 
it has to has the land well in the room mm. out loud. And I'm not a great actress, so. right? Mm. So the words so have to speak for themselves. She themself. can't sell it, you know. <laughs> it's just gotta it's just gotta work, and mm. and uh, I think that works for us a yeah. lot. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So when you're like, how do you come up with your ideas for your stories? Where does that come from? Well, sometimes it's from our own lives. Mm. You know, like I, I, we did a script that we sold to, I guess it was Warner Brothers Television a long time ago. Yeah. Um, that was oh, yeah. partially based on my family's life and Dawn's family's life. Mm. And we had, I had a, at the time a brother-in-law who was divorced and because of financial reasons had to, to live with his ex-wife who lived in the garage. And then it was kind of awkward dating. Yeah. And then <laughs> Dawn had an interesting situation with her brother having two kids at close to the same time with different women. So we sort of put it all together and thought, you know, this could be an interesting family tale. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we did sell it and never got made. Yeah. But um, so sometimes it's it's real life, sometimes um, based on a book or a character. Uh, yeah. A lot of times lately, you know, um, probably in the last decade or so, it's it's just been IP or mm -hmm. formats for a while it was formats and you know we were doing we did the killing and we didn't create the killing venus who did but we were there with her the whole time and um and that you know that inspired us to look at formats i'm not sure we ever we never really did develop a format did we we did one which one did we do that police one oh like unit one or something unit one. That it was one? a yeah. danish police show <laughs> yeah. yeah the killing was based on a danish format which is yeah, yeah. And then the last thing we did was more of an original idea, I guess. Yeah. You know, but uh, so it's you know, a little bit of both. Yeah. A little bit of both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, since you mentioned talking about the killing, though, I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. How you guys maybe got involved in that, and then like what the process was helping to develop the story for that, because it was a pretty big hit. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was the first of its kind. It mm -hmm. was sort of mm -hmm. before a lot of other shows that followed. So I think it was pretty unique because of that. Yeah. You know, I had met Venus Sood actually um, through, there's a Writers Guild program called the Showrunner Training Program. Mm. And I was involved with that in its early days. And um, Vina was one of the early um, participants in that program, which teaches, supposedly teaches people who are on the verge of showrunning how to be a showrunner. And yeah. um, so I had met her and we talked and we hit it off and I think um, as a result of that, she was looking for people to sort of be her number twos at the time yeah. um, on the show because she had she'd run Cold Case, but she had not created Cold Case. And so The Killing was the first show she created. And, and yeah. so we met with her, we saw her pilot, which was amazing. And I think we reassured her that we would always be there for her, Yeah, put her first. Um, We'd had, on our first pilot, our second in command had basically tried to steal our show behind oh, our backs. Wow. That's so awesome. yeah, having had mm. that experience, then we can always say to people, you know, we would never do that to mm. you. You know, we're there to support you in any way you think Yeah, we'll, we'll go down with the Titanic mm. if, if that's what, you know, because it's, it's your idea, it's your show, you know. I mean, that was our approach. And I think anyone on a writing staff uh, should be that way. Because it, it's when you're on a staff, it's a much bigger picture. You know, you are you are there to support the creator, showrunner, and your job is to make sure that you know that whatever they want, whatever their vision is, you do your best to bring it to the table. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Don't don't try to fix it by talking to the network yourself. We've been on shows <laughs> where where where. People on the writing staff have gone around the showrunner and tried to talk to the network and say, you know, they know what the problem is. They know how to fix it, you know, it's, and huge mistake. A lot of times networks are stupid enough to talk to those people and entertain those conversations, but it never plays out well mm -hmm. for that writer yeah. who does that. It's a bad idea. And I like <laughs> to think that we've had a lot of longevity. And mm -hmm. I think part of it is because People know they can trust us in whatever capacity we're in. We won't try to steal their show. We won't try to, you know, screw somebody over. We won't. We try to be very honorable in our dealings with people because, mm -hmm. you know, this industry, 
and careers are long. Yeah. yeah. You never know when something's going to come back at you. And if yeah. you've treated someone badly, you know, it may yeah. not go your way. Yeah. This industry, industry is all about relationships. Yeah. It, it really is. And um, so if you, especially television is about relationships. And if you don't play well with others, um, it, it, you're going to have a harder road, a much harder road. Mm-hmm. And there are plenty of uh, there are plenty of big showrunners who don't play well with others, mm-hmm. and um, you know they don't have staffs that stay with them for very long. You know, there's a lot of rotation, and maybe that's the way they want to that's the way they want to do it. But as far as we're concerned, you know, you gotta you gotta want to get up every day and go to work. And if it's an unpleasant, you know, negative situation, yeah, it's not All worth right. it. Yeah. How do you guys foster that? Uh, atmosphere like in the writers room because I know like when I worked with you guys on Z like that was one of the things I really loved and enjoyed was just coming into the writers room and everybody was so free to say their ideas and there was something we laughed we had a fun time and it was just a just a just a fun experience just to go into work and talk Um, so how do you guys kind of like and finding like those writers that like be fit the team well that's the number one thing you do is first you know one thing we've learned over the years we've made the mistakes (laughs) a lot of mistakes along the way and we've seen We've been on shows where the showrunner has made mistakes and hired people that then then turn out to be disasters. And we've learned to um, when we first, you know, we just use our judgment. You know, we mm-hmm. we, we meet people in the beginning and t- really talk to them, and then we um, vet them. We talk to people that that they have worked with. I mean, your reputation follows you, and so it's very important that you have a sterling reputation. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, we've gotten, we've gotten essential feedback from people that we've called before. There was one writer that we thought was brilliant. She was just brilliant. And she'd written, a, a, you know, an incredible screenplay. And we thought, this one would be so incredible. So she had been on another show. We knew the showrunner. And we called her up. And that showrunner, when she, when she heard what we were calling about, she, spent, she said, I've been waiting for this call for five years. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, she was like, this woman will destroy your writing staff. She she said she is a, she's a borderline personality. Mm. She plays people off each other. Mm. She makes everybody paranoid and anxious and competitive. And that's not what a, a room should be. The the goal of a room is to be this one big brain that is committed to making every episode the very best thing it can be. Not making my episode mm-hmm. good. It's every single episode. Mm-hmm. And so everyone, you know, that's why we want, we try to make everyone feel loved and appreciated for, for just being there, for trying, you know, for, for bringing ideas to the room. I'm sure you saw that a lot of times ideas are pitched and, and they don't go. And some of them may pitch a lot of ideas over and over again. Mm-hmm. And that's okay because eventually something will go. and. We just want to hear, we just want people to just sort of pitch in and give thoughts and mm. bring their lives to it too, because those are the most authentic and, stories. And I would say, in answer to your question to how we get that, mm-hmm. one thing we've started to do recently, and I will credit Glenn Mazera, who's a wonderful writer, um, who's been on The Shield and numerous other shows, with this concept, which is sort of now getting to be more popular, which is we do an opening day speech when we have a writing staff. And in that speech, we try to lay out what our expectations are for the room, and both in terms of you know productivity and also how you interact with others. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, pitch an idea once, maybe twice, and if it's not being accepted, move on. Never criticize somebody else's pitch. Mm-hmm. Never make it personal. Mm-hmm. We talk about, um, if somebody feels uncomfortable for any reason, whether it's language, whether it's um, they feel somebody said something that's racist or sexist or homophobic. Or made them feel unsafe. Yeah, made yeah. them feel unsafe. Please either come to us or come to our co-EPs. You know, we expect everybody to be treated with respect, including the support staff. Mm. You know, don't treat people lower than you with, in a bad way. And so yeah. that, you know, hopefully that will become more of a standard in the industry. It can be really cutthroat. So like a lot yeah. of times, yeah. you know, uh, 
writers, directors, producers, like it's just so everybody just like trying to climb the ladder and they're yeah. just stepping on people. They don't care about assistance. They don't yeah. care about exactly. the people that are the, the little people. They don't care. They just like, oh, I just want to get to the top and yeah. 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 That is, that's not the way it works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm on the board of the Writers Guild of America and we've had to deal with this a lot lately in terms of the Me Too movement and after George mm-hmm. Floyd was murdered, we've had to deal with um, you know, all these issues of sexism, racism, you know, dealing with others. And especially we did a survey about sexism in the business and sexual harassment and um, sexual assault. And I think it was something like 70% of writers had experienced it in some form, you know, mostly women and gay men. A lot of assistants had been harassed continuously mm-hmm. for years. And so, um, that kind of stuff has to stop, and hopefully, you know, we're getting to, it's getting better. You know, I think maybe bad behavior isn't being um, uh, rewarded yeah. and tolerated yeah. as much as it used to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so hopefully things will get better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, also, I think um, there are places that it can be reported to, there are steps that people can take. Right. You know, HR isn't only the isn't the only answer, but um, there's lots of things people could do, like reporting. I mean, this isn't. I know this isn't what you're asking about, but if somebody feels like they're being harassed or abused, they should write themselves an email in real time, mm. detailing what has happened, and keep a an ongoing real life, real time record of what type of abuse, and then they can hopefully find steps, you know, they can find out what steps they can take to either report it or Mm -hmm. let somebody know. I didn't know that that email Mm -hmm. thing. That's one of the things that's recommended because then you have a contemporaneous um, record of what's happened. And when it happened. And when it happened, and it's 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 been sent to you. Yeah. It's been Mm -hmm. sent to you, so it's not like you could, you're, you know, making it up. Right. Presumably, so. No, that's really good advice. Yeah. 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 So let's kind of go back to the killing a little bit. Um, Yeah. Uh, so you guys were you weren't the showrunners on that, right? You were right. We were we were co aps and then we were executive producers. Right. Yeah. So what was kind of the process uh, working on the show for you? Vina uh, is super professional. I mean, she's probably the most professional showrunner we've almost ever worked with. Yeah, and, and I mean, she even started before we even got into the room. We had to do a lot of research, so yeah. we went to the. Um, coroner's office and which was which is a lovely experience <laughs> which is exciting yeah, yeah. um <laughs> to see you know what real dead bodies look like yeah. what that experience is we went and talked to a group of um parents who'd lost kids because that was one of the thematics in the first season especially mm-hmm. um we spoke to police detectives you know so we did a lot of real life research because she always wanted it to be based in reality yeah you know it's if you look at that show you'll see that um our, our main lead character sarah is she wears jeans and a big oversized sweater and her hair and her ponytail and her lips are chapped she's not wearing a mini skirt and high heels so um so the reality of it was very important to her and and yeah um she ran a very she's a really good showrunner you can mm-hmm. do you want to talk about like how we actually broke story because that's um, oh, yeah, it was interesting the way she broke story. And, and we, we we got a lot from Vina, actually, that we've used, you know, yeah. as showrunners subsequent to that. Um, so she would have whiteboards all around the room. And the first, I don't know, I'd say the first week or so, you know, you just talk sort of big picture. Um, we talked about sort of the world, um, the characters, what they, you know, you know, it was kind of blue skying it, like all the different things it could be. Whenever some idea came up that Vena thought, yeah, I like that, you know, let's put that up on board. So we just kept throwing up ideas. Mm-hmm. So then we had a board with had all sorts of random ideas. And then um, we started talking about- what Like was, overall story arcs. Yeah. And like, character arcs. Yeah. And and then, so we would have, you know, Sarah, and then we would do her, 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 work, her crime, you know, her crime arc, her personal arc, um, and you know, then we the, would have the political, the political, there scene. was another character who we would tell his story. He was, a, he was a mayoral candidate. Um, and then we had, um, 
the family of, of the victim. And Vina really wanted to explore what it is to be, you know, the family of someone who, who is, is murdered like this, of a little girl, and not just sort of have it happen and then go away from them. So it's sort of have it happen and then how do, how do human beings, you know, go on with their lives? And you know, grieving and, and, you know, what kind of damage you know, can reverberates through the through the mm -hmm. family. I mean, it's a very upbeat show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then we would have it's very yeah. dark. We'd have one whiteboard that had every episode, like episodes one through twelve. Mm -hmm. And when we'd hit a point, we'd say, "Okay, we want Sarah to uh, her son runs away in episode ten, and we'd put that as a marker. Yeah. And so eventually, we'd get to the point where at least a couple of episodes had were a little more filled out beat wise. And then um, that would be assigned to somebody and they would go off, you know, or Don and I would go off for instance, if it was our episode and we knew certain beats we needed to hit. And we knew like, you know, uh, they go to this suspect. Could it be that person? No, it's not that person. This happens to the family. This happens to the, the mayor. This happens in, uh, this incident happens in Sarah's life. And then we had to take we, we, we would look just at our episode and we'd say, okay, how in the world do we make this a story? Mm -hmm. And that's that's your job as a writer then, is to sort of figure out how do, how, do, how does this structurally evolve the most effectively as a story? We would, we would, you know, do a quick outline that we felt like, you know, our beat sheet kind of, that we felt like could be mm -hmm. the story. We would come back into the room, throw the beats up on the wall and, uh, and then the room- And we'd have of, to pitch it. We'd to have to pitch, pitch it, it to the room. like what happens mm -hmm. in the story. And then, then the room's job was basically, you know, to kick the tires, you know, to poke holes, to, to figure out, is this the best way to tell the story? Is there something better? Does, it, does, does this story actually make someone think of something else mm -hmm. that's even better? And, you know, and so then it would change over the course. But finally, it would be at a place after like days, sometimes it'd be like two or three days with yeah. Vina, that she felt like, okay, this is this episode now. And then our job was to take all those beats and to do, to do an outline, just the two of us, or the writer, whoever the other writer was, would take it and do the outline. And- um, Go and, by Vina. Yeah, it would run it by Vina, and then it would then it would go into the studio and you know the process would, would begin, you know, so. And if they, once the studio and the network okayed the outline, then you're off to write. And so you write from your outline. Yeah, and, and Vina's show, which some shows do and some shows don't. If you were writing, you would be out of the room and the room would continue. I mean, subsequently, what we've done is break a number of, of episodes, like we did this on our show, Hidden Run, and then everybody would go off at the same time and have two weeks to write an episode and then come back and, so that you, because the room was small enough that we didn't, we would really miss anybody who was gone off yeah. writing. So yeah. there are different ways one can do it. Yeah. Well, we can talk about Hidden Run since we're talking. That's your, yeah. your latest show that you guys did. Yeah. Um, what was that, and, these, and what was the that process like for you? It was an amazing process in certain ways because um, we we got together with these two Israeli men who had created Fauda, and one of them, Lior Raz, had started in Fauda, the Israeli TV series, and. Um, we all, I think the four of us got along because they're partners, we're partners. He understood the partner mentality. <laughs> right. <laughs> and one of them is a, is a journalist. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. still to this day is a, is a journalist. Yeah, Avi. So. Um, Avi Isak. Wait. Do it. Isak Ra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was always making fun of me. It's a hard name. <laughs> yeah. They had a basic idea and um, we, you know, because they were in Israel, it was kind of challenging. The first time we got together was in New York. Yeah. We Netflix flew us to New York. They flew from Israel to New York and we tried to break the basic outline of the story. Yeah. Then they came to LA. We finished breaking that story. We pitched it to Netflix. Um they really liked it. They yeah. told us to go off and write a Bible. <laughs> which is funny because we had to actually go to Israel to write the Bible oh, with yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Was that your first time in Israel? It was. It was. It, it was. It was our first time. And so Nicole and I are just on the ground in uh, Tel Aviv kind of 
wandering around looking for a place for dinner the, the first night we were there, kind of thinking, oh my God, how did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> how did we end up in Israel? <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience working there and working with them. Um, and and we, we, so we wrote the Bible, which was not a particularly long Bible, but it really just said what the arc of the series would be. Character descriptions, place. We talked about place because the show was set both in New York and Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And then we submitted to Netflix, and then this was the Netflix of yore. It was Netflix of a couple of years ago. They just picked it up to series based on the Bible and, and the script. And yeah. the script. We yeah. wrote the script. She jumped over the script. There, oh, yeah. was a, there was a script in there too. We pitched it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We, yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we pitched it to Netflix. We pitched the story to Netflix. They approved it. We wrote the script. Yeah, we wrote they, the outline and they approved that. And then, yeah, yeah the, the typical kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wrote yeah. the Bible. They picked it up to series. We had a room. Yeah. Um, and for like six months, maybe. Yeah, about a six month room. Yeah. And um, that was super challenging, actually, because they were in Israel most of the time. Sometimes they would come in. Oh, thank you. Sometimes they would come in um, to, they'd come into LA, uh, Avi and Lior, and, um, and be there in the room and, um, you know, sort of throwing out ideas with all the writers. And, and Avi and Lior, obviously they're, they're Israeli and their first language is Hebrew. And so, so they, don't, they don't actually write, um, write the scripts. And, and so, but they were very involved <laughs> in, in every aspect of story. And, and you know they were and even at the script level you know they really cared about about everything which was great because because we were writing about a world that they knew much more intimately um but it was interestingly it was just pre-covid we we yeah. started shooting during covid i mean we ended up hitting into covid but so nobody was zooming so um they would skype in from tel aviv yeah and that's how we'd have them in the room sometimes on a big screen at the end of our writer's room. Two <laughs> big like bald a, heads is it like at the a end. 12, 10 hour difference or something? Or like the. It would change because their the time would get different, but it was yeah. like 10? Yeah, I think it 10 was. 10 or 11? Yeah. Or 10 yeah, or 9, I mean, something like that. We eventually came up with this system where we would, if they weren't able to be in the room, we would have our writer's assistant write notes. Mm. And they'd get sent out every night. And when the guys would wake up in, in Israel, they could read the notes, comment, mm. send it back to us, and then we could discuss during the day you know, yeah. what their concerns were, what their thoughts were. Yeah, we had a, a lot of, it was, it was challenging because it's also, you know, when you're, the four of us made a team. You know, we were, the, we were the, Nicole and I were the showrunners, and, uh, but Avi and Lior were executive producers with us. and. So we were we were a team together, sort of creating the show and driving it forward, and it's a marriage, and and we didn't really know them very well, and <laughs> so there were there were trust issues um, yeah. in the beginning, both sides, um, sensitivities, mm. cultural issues that came up that surprised us all. Yep. Yeah, we so we 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 just I think it. It really served us that we're women, and um, but also that they are good people. They were good people, and Israelis tend to be very direct. Yeah, <laughs> if you yes, have known I know, any, I know a few. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and they're very authentic, very direct. They don't bull. Yeah. And so, sorry, <laughs> but they they are just like this is the way it is, and they don't they don't want to be handled. And mm -hmm. even though Nicole and I would be think of trying. to to think of nice ways to say to them, no, we don't like that idea that you have, um, that that would never work. They would miss it. They would miss the point of our conversation. <laughs> so we learned, they would be just kind of like, what do you really think? You know, what do you want? What are you saying? <laughs> and so we, and we, we finally learned, we learned how to be actually, you know, kind of less female about it and just more mm. like this is what we think we don't like this idea it's just it's not working is it just it's dumb it's just dumb <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you said that <laughs> there might have been some heated moments where we, yeah. things like that were said you know and they would say similar things back at us and, but it was like hey so but the the um the netflix was actually very supportive of 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 all of us and really flexible and understood that this was a delicate situation mm -hmm. and miraculously <laughs> We, we all made it work. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
So what were some of the highlights of working on the project? Oh, man. Well, I think, and we shot in New York for five months. Yeah. So um, that was interesting. Um, we we shot Z in New York as right, well, yeah. as, mm -hmm. as you know, but yeah. I think it hadn't been for as long. We had, yeah. It hadn't been five months. And um, and then we flew to Israel, and this is 2020. Yeah. And um, so we had to move to a different country. We had to, you know, we uh, the Israelis were great, so welcoming, so good at what they did. But there were some... Like Don said, cultural differences. We had a, a crew that was from all over the world, actually. Our mm -hmm. directing producer, Mike Barker, was British. We had um, lots of Israelis, obviously. We had a, an, an Australian a, a DP. DP. Yeah. yeah, an American production designer. Um, so we had the, all, all these different people had to come together and work. Mm -hmm. And it went really well until one day in March when we started hearing, uh, there's this thing called COVID coming down the pike, but we didn't know what that was exactly. And, and they were said, worried, right? They, they were a little worried. They was said, worried. They, like, yeah. they said, let's speed it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, are there things we can cut? Can we get out of here sooner? And we came up with a plan. And as I always say, at 7 a.m. that morning, we had a meeting and they said, okay, the plan's a go. You know, cut the things you said, let's move forward. And at 7 p.m. that night, they said, we're pulling the plug. We hear Israel's about to shut down. You guys need to get out of there within three days. We had to shut the entire production down and leave. Everyone had to go home. We got home the day, we left the day it was closing. On the 15th, yeah. Yeah, and then the next day, I think California shut down. Yeah. And wow. We thought they were overreacting. Yeah. yeah. We thought, this is ridiculous. Uh, oh yeah. my God, this is so stupid. And But no, they weren't overreacting at all. They were afraid they weren't gonna be able to get us out of, mm. of Israel because you know, international flights were stopping. Yeah. yeah. So it was like it was like the last the last flight out. But but then we, you know, speaking about highlights, we had to end up doing all the post production almost all on Zoom. Yeah. Which we'd never done before, and so while while we were home after we shut down, we still had, a, you know, a fair amount more to shoot. We edited everything we had, and we found it worked really well on yeah. Zoom. That was actually like I. I wouldn't necessarily go back to sitting in an editing room with an editor. Um, it's much I think more efficient. It's much more efficient, and mm -hmm. it gives the editor a little more autonomy, a little more freedom to find it, mm -hmm. you know. And I think our editor probably liked it a yeah. lot better. And we, you know, we um, we did music, we did everything sort of that way. And then finally, in in um, January twenty twenty one. Netflix felt it was safe enough for us to go back, but of course we weren't vaccinated at the time. We had to fly unvaccinated, which was scary. And then there were very- Wait, tell, tell them how we flew. <laughs> I don't know if I want to say no, that. Just... <laughs> okay, well, I would just say that Don said, I'm just going to put a blanket over my head and fly the 15 hours to Israel. And I said, you know what? You cannot put a blanket over your head and fly 15 hours to Israel. So I found this thing that I read about on Shark Tank where I saw on Shark, yeah. Shark Tank, which is a, it was for soccer moms and dads who need to watch their kids play in the rain. Mm -hmm. So it's like a clear <laughs> plastic pop-up box. It's like, <laughs> like a bubble that you can wear that has like a, a, a it's open in the bottom, but you know, but nothing can get on you. Yeah. <laughs> and so we ended up, at first it's like, okay, I'm bringing it, but I'm not using it. He, she sent me a picture and she said, are you really serious about this? I'm like, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we actually did fly that. We sat there, we sat there in, our, in, our, in our clear little boxes thing. And we just sort of sat there in, 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 in our seats. And Nicole and I were at Cindy together. And she was on the other side of the, of the airplane. And I would look around and I would see like the seats and then there'd be this clear <laughs> box thing sticking up. But honestly, just... people at the time were jealous because no they one were. was vaccinated mm -hmm. and it was scary yeah. as hell. The flight but... attendants were like, that's really good. Where'd you get that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then we, then we had the shot with, we had to shoot with, um, you know, the strict COVID protocols, right, which yeah, everybody which is, knows, yeah. which now is the real thing. And yeah. that wasn't that fun, but we got it done. Yeah, you know, Israelis are really good at getting stuff done. Mm. I mean, they yeah. really, you know, they they were all in the army. And so, and it's, it's not, you know, this is your job and this is your job and this is my job. It's 
all for one, one for all. Right. I mean, everybody does everything. They also feel, you know, very, very inclined to weigh in on everything. Doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, very strong opinions. Yeah. Like a, a, a like a, a, a like a, a PA, a set PA would sit with us, and then she would like comment on takes. <laughs> She'd yeah. be like, "That didn't really work for me." And so then we would be like, "Would you go tell the director that?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were just, but we we love them. We loved. Mm. I think the highlight of it all was the Israeli people. Yeah. We mm. loved the Israelis and. Um, and we loved Israel. I, yeah. I'm not sure we would ever have made it to Israel um, and if we hadn't been shooting a show there. And we it was managed a, to travel all over. Yeah, it was, a, it was an adventure, so. Yeah, um, it was great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So I know we talked a little bit at the beginning about how yeah. you guys work together and mm -hmm. partners, but like, do you guys do a lot of outlining when you start a project? Do you do do, you do index cards? Like what? what's oh. your, yeah. What's, let's get into the nitty gritty for so, the, yeah. We always do an outline. We don't do a 25 page outline, but no. we, we do do, we do write maybe a 12 page outline for mm -hmm. what we're doing and <clears throat> really do believe in outlining everything. Um, we found, you know, over the years, there've been many different things we've all done. And um, I think we did this on Z as well, where we had a whiteboard with yeah. magnetic um, strips. Yeah. Of, so you, instead of a little card, you, you probably could, were. Like, yeah, remember that. Remember that. <laughs> yeah. So some people still use index cards. We don't. We even when we're working on our own projects. I remember when we wrote Z, it was we were in my office at home, mm -hmm. and we had our whiteboard and we our magnetic whiteboard and our strips, and that way you can erase them, you can move them around. Yeah. For us, that system seemed to work pretty well. And actually, yeah, it worked really well. Yeah. You know, they don't come. The right size and so as you know um <laughs> so so we had to buy you know like sh sheets of the magnetic whiteboard, whiteboard stuff and yeah. and cut them and then then we would slap them up yeah <laughs> that was always fun like yeah that'd be yeah yeah oh no move it okay there that's where yeah. that one goes we love that we start you know at the beginning obviously we write out loud yeah um it's always slower in the beginning we always find mm. You know, nowadays with streaming, we don't have apps, so we or what right, we're working on. Structure is different. Yeah. Structure, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. but would it, would it essentially be the first act takes us a little bit longer to get going. Yes, but then we because uh, you're establishing characters and stories. And yeah, yeah. And so for Don and I, we do not go back. I mean, I will will write a scene. I'll read it back to Don. Yeah, and we'll, we'll make uh, changes. You if know, if it doesn't work, and then we move on, mm -hmm. and we keep going. You know. Um, beat by beat until we get to the end mm -hmm. and then um, like literally send it to Don we both print it out and that's the first time I've seen it yeah you know like we've we've written it out loud together but it's the first time I've actually seen it on paper and so then so then I will like have a raft of notes just because I'll see it you know right. and Nicole will have been looking at it but I will see it but, so, so then, then we both give our notes yeah. and um, do a rewrite you know and yeah um, you know, sometimes we fight. Oh, we fight. Yeah, <laughs> we definitely fight. Yeah. Um, let's, let's hear about that. What are some, what are some fights? We, you, <laughs> you know, we, we, we just argue. I mean, it's just normal, like, you know, work yeah. choices mm. or, you know, I think we're, we've are we been working together for so long that we probably fight less. I think stuff. we do. Now. I think we really do. Because I think we've kind of melded into the same writer. I mean, mm. we have, there's a third writer. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and she, she knows what she's doing at this point, you know, and she's, she's got a pretty good instinct of what's going to work. But um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually really, I really like our process. I don't know if, if you could do it another way at this mm, point, yeah. you know, it would just be like weird. So do you have like different strengths and weaknesses that you kind of balance each other out a little bit or how would you say that? Yeah, although we surprise each other. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's, it's so hard to know, I think, yeah. um, because at this point, like Don said, it's been yeah. so long. And I mean, a good thing about, even though it sounds like it would take longer for us to write out loud every word, um, because we've been doing it so much that we're pretty fast and we've had to work when we both had our kids, we'd yeah. have to, you know, we 
go home and put the kids to bed and then come back at nine and work nine to 12 so we can do it over the phone. We can do it in an airport. We could do it in a oh lobby. Oh my God, yeah. We, we wrote a pilot in the lobby of the hotel we were in in New York. In the middle of a Christmas party. There was some yeah. office Christmas party happening all around us. Nicole and I are just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was That's crazy. Awesome. It was crazy. Yeah, you just get to that point where we just go into the zone, you know, and then we just do it. It's amazing to me that it's as coherent as it is mm. because because life is always happening around right. us right. while we're while we're working but I think it's just it's so second nature now but yeah. the, in terms of strengths and weaknesses I'd say like there like there are times where where I'll feel like okay I know I just really feel like we need like a really sharp retort here or something mm. we need this yeah. be like come on Nicole come on this is your kind of thing yeah. your and she'll just be like ah, I don't know and then she'll just throw something out. I'll be like, yes, that's it. No. <laughs> but we do that for each other. It's like, I know. But I, it's hard to even break down what the differences are at this point. No, because we are like one brain when mm. we do it. But, you know, we always say, look, I'm Jewish. I'm from L.A. Oh. Don's Presbyterian from Dallas. And yeah. somehow we came together and made this. I think it makes us more holistic in our approach mm. to things. We have very different upbringings but we are both the oldest child and the only girl in our family so i think that that probably serves us in some way i don't know or maybe it doesn't (laughs) we're both very controlling yeah i mean creatively with our work we're very controlling and so Mm -hmm. so that's one of our, our our always our argument is we're we're being like, you know, we really feel strongly that it should go this way mm. or that way, you know, and we and we work it out. And we never, you know, after doing this for years, it, we never like take it home. It's so not personal, yeah. you know, we're, like, we're just kind true. of like, yeah. we just, we know what it is. We understand. It's like we just really care. And so we're always trying to make it good, you yeah. know, make it right. really good. Right. That's it. Oh, that's excellent. That's really good advice. Yeah. I think sometimes you get... Sometimes if you have friends that are critiquing your work, they get a little nervous of being honest with you because uh-huh. they don't want to hurt your feelings. Right. Um, but when you can have a partner that you really trust and it doesn't matter, it's like, we're still going to be friends, but I'm going to tell you this sucks. Yeah. And, yeah. and we're not going to be hurt by it. We're not going to like get emotional. No, we're that's not, right. We're still going to be friends. Yeah. But yeah. I'll tell you, you know, that made me think of um, what we do when, after everybody has written a script um, in our writer's room, it, their script, then their first draft goes to us and all the other writers, mm. including I think the writer's assistant um, gets the script as well, right? And our, our the task, we do homework, unfortunately. And Nate probably remembers this part. Yes, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. yeah. Nate, and you would get it too, right? Yeah. And you get it, yes. Yeah. So it really, you know, everyone who's understanding what the story is, you know, who's been part of the writer's room, gets it. And then their job is to, is to go through and give feedback, you know, give criticism, written be, feedback, written feedback mm-hmm. on, you know, on a, on a page, not like, not I'll write it on the script, you know, like write what your notes are, page two, you know, this line, whatever, I think it could be better. And, but our rule is you can criticize the hell out of something, but you have to have a solution. It doesn't have to mm-hmm. be the solution we agree with. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be brilliant, but it has to be, mm-hmm. you have to fix it. You have to try to fix it. And for us, that was, for one thing, very helpful for us as the showrunners to have some, you know, a a smart group of writers trying to solve the problem. And then we would take those notes from everybody and we'd go through all of them and mark, you know, try this, yes, no, and then give those back to the actual writer for their rewrite. Yeah, and so they would know specifically what we wanted them to do based on everybody's notes, including our own. But, mm-hmm. you know, they, they would know. So they, they're going through and they're sometimes like other writers would, would write, you know, new like paragraphs or, or lines, you know, little, mm-hmm. you know, little run of dialogue. And we would be like, we like this. Pick it up, stick it in your script. Mm-hmm. And when a writer is doing that psychologically, it, it just works better for them because they're not because they're still making those changes instead of somebody is taking their script away from them and rewriting it gives them them more ownership it gives them much more ownership and and at least the feeling of some autonomy Mm -hmm. um and and so we you know it's really important to us that criticism always comes with a solution Mm -hmm. you know it's not an idea and we would say if you don't have a solution then don't even bring it up you know Mm -hmm. don't even don't even mention like you can't just go 
this thing just didn't really work for me. Yeah, <laughs> you can't do that. You have to say this is how it would work if it did if it did these things. Mm. You know, you have to do that. And if you, the other thing is, if you really love the script, then then go through and point out specifically moments and places and dialogue that you love, mm. so that we also know, and so that that writer is getting the positive feedback that yeah. they deserve as well. So, which is really encouraging for yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We all need a little bit of that. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Um, kind of looking back on your career, are there any regrets that you guys have? Or maybe maybe not even regrets, but maybe things that you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Wow. I would say, you know, I think we mentioned earlier that the first pilot we ever did, which was at CBS right. with Richard Dreyfuss, was called the Education of Max Bickford. Um, we had never run a show before, and we were, we came up in the time where it was only network TV, and you'd go from being a staff writer to a story editor to you know you'd have to work your way up. So right. we'd gone through all those steps. We we're finally running a show. Um, we ran into some issues with. I mean, it it was received very well. Got really good reviews. We won the Writers Guild Award for at the time they had best pilot, mm -hmm. but. 9-11 happened, you know, for whatever reason, the, the uh, ratings started to go down and, mm -hmm. and CBS started asking us to make changes, some of which we were willing to make, some we felt... Uh, change the, you know, the pr essence. profoundly changed the essence of the show. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we, we just been, basically didn't know how to write the show they wanted us to write. You're like, Yeah, and it was sure. sort of an edgy show. It was a little bit like House, but it was, you know, we had a a curmudgeonly sort of uh, not necessarily nice guy professor. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a professor at a women's college, American studies professor, and his former student comes in as the head of his department. He's having problems with that. His uh, He has a bad relationship with his daughter. He's sober. His best friend has become a trans woman, mm -hmm. which is a long oh. time ago we did that. But um, yeah. anyway, while we were saying to CBS, we can do these changes, but not these changes, um, our second in command was saying, going behind our back to CBS and saying, give me the script, I'll do what you want. Or give me the show, I'll do what you want. Yeah, or having some kind of conversation that led CBS to believe, well, you know, he's a man. <laughs> and he hasn't written any of the episodes yet, but he's a man. And let's, let's like, you know, maybe he should run the show. And so they then they told us, um, you know, we we think he should run the show now, and we were well. We, we went we went to our friend Barbara Hall, who yeah. had created Judging Amy and has created um, Madam Secretary and this was Joan before, of Arcadia, yeah. yeah. And said to her, "What should we do? Because this is what they're doing." And she said, "I think it's better to live and die in your own vision." Mm -hmm. So we told CBS and Twentieth. Um, Century Fox that we were stepping back that we didn't want to continue on the show. Yeah. yeah, and then that got us blackballed from CBS. Literally, Les Moonves said, "You know, I got I'll have them work at my network over my dead body." Yeah, and um, so that seemed like a horrible thing to us at the time. I mean, yeah. we didn't regret our decision, but we also thought, we thought it was the end of our career. Yeah. Basically, we we really did. We thought you it know, spent a lot of time at CBS at that point. Yeah. But then, as it turned out, another door opened, and we ended up going to HBO and doing the show called Carnival, and um, only done cable and streaming since then. And yeah. so, you know, you never know. You sometimes you think it's the worst moment of your life, and it ends up being a yeah a good thing, mm -hmm. which is a good lesson. And I have for no life. regrets over how no. we dealt with that because no. I, I think it's true. I think we just wanted to make a good show. Yeah, <laughs> that's all we were doing. Yeah. I know. <laughs> No, that's good. I think I and keep keeping your integrity. Exactly. You know, because I think this industry it kind of destroys people sometimes. You it know? absolutely you know? does. It absolutely does. And you're right. And keeping your integrity, um, in uh, in every way, mm -hmm. you know, in every way, um, there's compromising. Like you know, we compromise with each other about ideas, and writers have to compromise if they're on writing staffs, you know, and all of that. But right. but um, and you do you take notes from your network all the time, so you are compromising sometimes there mm -hmm. but but you should never be doing something that you f 
fundamentally, you know, don't believe in mm -hmm. and and to feel like, you know, you are you are damaging with the story that you're telling and because it will follow you forever, you know, what mm -hmm. you do just will stay out there. You know, that's the problem with television. <laughs> it never goes away now, yeah. especially when you're, you know, streaming. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. They're there for all time, right? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so what's some advice that you would give to maybe new writers that are starting out? Wow. Well, there's like the overall advice I would always give is, it seems like everybody's running a script and you'll never get a break, but you will eventually get a break. Mm -hmm. And we always believe that good writing will out. Always, mm -hmm. always. And it's not, and you won't believe this when you hear it, but it's really not about, um, it's not about opportunity and, and who you know. I mean, it is to a certain extent, like you need to put yourself in environments sometimes that, that, that will enable you to someday i'll give an example you your job is just to make yourself as good as possible that's your job you know you write and you write and you write and you and don't you write. just write one script no mm -hmm. no you write a script you get feedback from people that you trust and then you write another one and then you write another one and you keep going and eventually when you are ready and only the universe knows when that is okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you if you have religion, you'll you, it's when God decides. And if it's just it's about fate, you know, it's like there when it's time, it's it's time and and a door opens. And uh, one example that we give, I was part of opening the door, but it's still kind of a crazy thing is I was um, I was teaching in a writing program that's in Juvenile Hall. And uh, there was there was a young guy who was just sort of. His job was to sit in the office in the middle of juvenile hall. He was not a juvenile. He was part of this program called Inside Out Writers. And he sat in the office and he made sure that all of us teacher people had pencils and, and snacks for the kids and all of that. So we would see him. I would see him every time I went. And his name was um, Nate Halpern. And and Nate was, I he was such a nice guy. And so cool, just really chill. And I finally, I was like, "What do you do? You know, what are you doing when you're not doing this?" And he's like, "Well, I, you know, I got just graduated from the NYU, and you know, and I'm just, you know, I, I just am writing, and and you know, I have a web series that I'm doing, and and then I was just like, oh, he's a writer, yeah. And so then, <laughs> which unfortunately is our reaction to writers. And so I was like. Oh, good. And then eventually I kept seeing him and finally he would sit there reading books and things. And, and I would say, okay, Nate, I will read a script of yours. Do you have one? And he's like, I have seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, you pick the best one then because that's all I'm going to read. <laughs> and so he, he gave me a script, a screenplay, and um, I liked his writing. I liked his style. And, you know, I gave him some notes and it was just that. And then Venus Sood has this... Um, when we were on The Killing, the second season, she elevated our first year writer's assistant to then a writer in the room on staff uh, the second year. So we needed a new writer's assistant. And her rule, which is a great rule, is she she hires writer's assistants who are writers who wanna, who wanna mm -hmm. be writers. And she gives them scripts. She gives them a script so that they can they can, you know, do the job, be in the room, learn everything, learn the show, and then if all goes well, the next season, they're writers on staff. Mm -hmm. And so she was looking for, you know, people who who had good material that were were nowhere close to being, you know, chosen to be on staff. And um, I gave her Nate's script because I thought, I thought I think she might like that. And she loved it. And Nate went from like this little office in the middle of Juvenile Hall, you know, downtown Los Angeles, <laughs> to sitting in a writer's room <laughs> taking notes. And he, he, his, his script that he wrote, uh, um, he, he got to write a script for the show and uh, that, that season. And Venus Dude directed it. That was when she directed. And um, so I remember seeing him up on, on set in, um, in Vancouver and just like <laughs> standing there in the rain, you know, like amazed. He's gone on to tremendous success mm -hmm. on on Fargo and what was the name of the other show that um, they created the show? Noah Noah Wiley was doing. 
Uh, or not Noah. Yeah. What's his name? Not Noah Wiley. No. Noah. Holly. Holly. <laughs> um, he, he, he then, you know, was very involved in the other show as well. And then he created a show um, for Amazon called... Um, Oh, Nate, I'm sorry, I can't remember your show. Yeah, I'm, I can't either. I can't remember Nate's show. Everybody look up Nate Halpern's show on Amazon <laughs> and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was very much his show. And um, so he's like, you know, and, but well, what happened for him is that he was ready. Mm-hmm. He didn't know he was ready. I mean, he probably felt ready long before that, but he was finally ready. The door opened. I opened a door because I just, felt the impulse to read to read him Mm -hmm. and that's random but that's the way it is and so your job as a writer is to work on your writing so that you are ready for that open door Mm -hmm. that you have the script to hand and it's the script that will will then open all the other doors for you Mm -hmm. yeah that's what i'm saying no that's true yeah um what uh what books are you guys reading now or what stories are you reading? You know, after doing after doing Hit and Run, we're big fans of international thrillers. Mm, <laughs> we okay. really are. So we've been reading a lot of international thrillers. Yeah. Um, I just finished reading a book called The Late Comer mm. by Jean. Oh, I'll never be able to remember her name, but look it up. It's a wonderful novel. Yeah. Um, what else have we read lately? Uh, uh, that Chris Bone series, Two Nights in Lisbon. Yeah. Um, we read a bunch of. We're we're always sent. Most of the reading we do is for work. Mm. So we're sent. Yeah. A, we're sent a lot of books and um, to consider, you know, turning into series and or galleys of books. Um, so books that haven't, you know, aren't even close to being published until sometime next year. Um, so, but it's it's interesting. They're sort of falling into the thriller category, the female-driven thriller type thing. The one you read is not, but no, it's um, a family drama. Yeah, which, which I really like. So we we probably don't read as much for pleasure as we would like mm. to. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I'm reading a Scandinavian novel right now, but for just for pleasure. But you know. Yeah. But it's like a little bit at a time. <laughs> one I sentence keep, here, one sentence. Yeah, because I keep having to like then divert because we just have like you know a weekend to read a, right. a book, right. you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I recently, you know, during COVID, you watch a lot of stuff. So I I rewatched the all the Sopranos and The Wire. Mm. Um, and the Wire is such a great show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really the, probably the best show yeah. ever. And I even like the, the the new show that David Simon did. Mm. Um, but um, so then I spent a little bit of time reading that um, the Sopranos book written by Michael Imperioli. You know, it was sort of an oral history of the Sopranos, mm-hmm. which was which is uh, pretty interesting if you're interested in the TV process. Yeah, you know, and how a classic is made. Mm. Yeah, you know, and that was I found that pretty informative. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Are there any like books that you would recommend as far as uh, maybe about writing or about story? I would recommend, oh, you know what? It's been a long time since, you know, we haven't, we haven't read a, you know, writing a, mm-hmm. writing a teleplay or anything book in a hundred years, if ever. I'm not even sure if we ever read one. Um, but, but what I would recommend is reading scripts. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, yeah. obviously people are watching TV and then, they're, then they think, you know, I think I can write this. But you know what you really need to do? I, so many writers do not also read scripts. Read scripts so you can understand how to sell your story and sell yourself as a writer on page. Because Nicole and I are very attracted to, um, I mean, like I, when, when we read scripts, I've got to, I've got to be, you know, grabbed within like the first three pages or I'm just kind of like, I'm out. And the things that grab me are a great hook, you know, Mm -hmm. that a really uh, compelling character or- Amazing writing. Amazing writing, yeah, a situation or, yeah, or incredibly like wonderful literary writing. Like just, we really, really respond to writers who are really writers. You know, writers who could be writing 
plays or writing uh, novels or short stories, but this is, happens to be a screenplay. You know, we love a very, very literate, you know, description. Um, you know, we're not big fans of cliches. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, you know, most scripts are available free yeah. online. Yeah. You can find them somewhere. And when you read them, sometimes it's surprising because styles have changed. Yeah. If you read, you know, maybe a show from the era of The Sopranos or I'm not sure about The Wire. I'm not sure if I've read one of those scripts, but styles change. Things become a little more visual, a little more literary these days, yes. I think. Yes. Than they used to be. More cinematic yeah. as well, you know. And, uh, you know, we really, we love that. We put that a lot of that in our writing. We like to basically, you know, shoot the, the movie on our page, you know. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean putting in camera angles or anything like that. Um, and read pilots, like, yeah. you know, the pilot of The Shield, the pilot of Bro Breaking Bad. There's so many amazing pilots out there that, you know, yeah. Sopranos. Yeah. The pilot of uh, The Old Man is really good. I, you yeah. know, I'm not a big fan necessarily of the rest of the show. Um, but it, it is a very it's good It's a pilot. wonderful pilot. It's a really, really well done, really smart pilot. Um, and like, what other pilots have we read recently, or are we pilots that we've watched recently that we knew were really great? Um, did they really hooked um, Severance is Severance it was it's a great mm, series great series we haven't read that script yeah I think somebody was telling me that the pilot script that you can find maybe online somewhere is very different than it might have been a screenplay too uh, uh, is very different than the, the TV series however it might be worth reading because that script was written by somebody who was just was at NYU right it was his his grad you know graduate thesis, thesis yeah. I believe um so that would be worth reading because it's good to see what has someone written recently that you know changed everything for him. Mm -hmm. That I, that would be definitely worth reading. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. I don't know if you have any other last thoughts or or comments before we wrap this up, but um... I would. My last thought would be, you know, if you are if you're really in love with this, you know, don't give up. Mm. Just keep making yourself better, you know? Just hone your skill. Don't feel like, well, this is as good as I get. I mean, we're getting better with everything we write. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, and, and that's like hundreds hundreds in, uh, of scripts later. You know, I think we, you know, we just have a, a skill set and I, I think yeah. just the talent on the page is better. And, and I would also say that everybody's journey is different yes you know, the road is different for everybody yeah. yeah we've we've known people who've written a short film that gets made and that's the thing that you know makes their career go wild somebody we worked with on um the killing who was the writer's assistant who then went on to be very successful just worked in, in a job in business affairs at a studio you know and just kept his writing in his free time and and that gave him an opportunity finally because he was sort of on the periphery of the business. But reading scripts, you know, he was sort of getting everybody's scripts and reading them, so yeah. learning. Yeah, so everybody's journey is different and it's mm -hmm. it's easy in this business to think, oh God, they're so lucky, they did this, they did that, or they got this chance, but your road will be your own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, and if you're a good writer, I really believe, you you know, talent will out. Yeah, opportunity comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show. I really, so really welcome. appreciate it. Yeah, I just I love hearing your insight and your your wise words and encouragement. Yeah, it's just, it's really really a blessing and an honor. Oh well, yeah. thank, well, thank you, you so much for having us. It's yeah. it is an honor to be here. Yeah, it awesome. Is. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.